Hello everyone and welcome to this week's OpenGL 3D game tutorial and this week we're going to be having a look at the basics of the geometry shader. So before we have a look at the geometry shader let's just quickly recap what our shader pipeline looks like at the moment. So let's say that we want to render a simple cube. The first stage of the pipeline is the vertex shader which takes in each vertex of the model and it processes them individually. The vertex shader gets its input data for each vertex from the VAO and it outputs the vertex with various user defined values associated with it. The vertex shader also sets the inbuilt GL position variable for each vertex and this inbuilt variable tells OpenGL where on the display the vertex should be positioned. At this stage OpenGL then assembles the triangles from the outputted vertices or to be more general it actually assembles the primitives at this stage and primitives are just the building blocks of what you're rendering. We've always rendered triangles in these tutorials, but you can actually just render lines instead, or even just points. Points of course would just be a single vertex, lines would be two vertices, and triangles are obviously made of three vertices. In this example, the primitive that we're rendering is triangles. Once OpenGL has assembled the primitives and determined where on the display they should be rendered, the fragment shader executes once for each pixel that the primitives cover on the screen. The inputs to the fragment shader are the interpolated per vertex variables and the fragment shader uses these values to determine the output color of the pixel. So this is the shader pipeline that we've always used in these tutorials but we can actually add in more shader stages to this such as the geometry shader. The geometry shader fits in right here after the primitives have been assembled. The geometry shader then executes once for each primitive so if we're rendering triangles it executes once for each triangle in the model. If we were rendering a load of lines it would execute once for each line and if we were rendering points it would execute once for each point. The input to the geometry shader therefore is the entire primitive that it's executing for. So unlike the vertex shader which just has access to one vertex, the geometry shader has access to all of the vertices in the current primitive and any values that have been assigned to them by the vertex shader. So if we're rendering triangles, the geometry shader will have access to all three vertices and the values associated with them. This means that the output variables of the vertex shader are now the input variables of the geometry shader and notice that the geometry shader inputs have to be arrays because the input primitive can have more than one vertex and so there's more than one of each input variable. If you're rendering points, these arrays will actually just contain one element each because there's obviously just one vertex in a point, but if you're rendering lines then there would be two values in each array, and if you're rendering triangles there would of course be three values in each of these arrays, one for each vertex in the triangle. The geometry shader then uses these inputs to process the primitive in whatever way we want it to, and it then generates and outputs some primitives. The type of primitive that it outputs, how many of them there are and what they're like is totally up to us as the programmer. If we wanted we could use those inputs to generate the exact same triangle and output that, although that would kind of be pointless and we might as well just not have a geometry shader then. We could however process each triangle and output three triangles or six triangles or however many we wanted. We can even output zero if we want, so the geometry shader can also be used to remove geometry. And it doesn't just have to output the same primitive type as its input. For example, let's say that we're rendering points instead of triangles. The geometry shader executes once for each point, and for each point it could generate two triangles, or maybe six lines, or whatever you want. It's totally up to you what your geometry shader does and outputs, and the only restriction is that it can only have one output primitive type. So you can either choose to output triangles, lines, or points. You can't output a mixture. When we generate these new vertices in the geometry shader, we can also give them some per vertex values in exactly the same way that we do in the vertex shader. So we can give these vertices any values that we want to give them, whether it be a color, a brightness value, some distance, or anything else, just whatever information about the vertices we want to pass on to the fragment shader. And of course, we also have to set the inbuilt GL position variable for each vertex to tell OpenGL where the vertices should be positioned on the display. And that is the geometry shader's job done, so after that the fragment shader can just go ahead and do its usual thing with the generated primitives. One important thing to note is that the inputs for the vertex shader come from the VAO, the outputs of the vertex shader are now the inputs of the geometry shader, and the outputs of the geometry shader are now the inputs to the fragment shader. So the vertex shader and the fragment shader now no longer interact with each other at all, so the inputs to the fragment shader no longer have to be anything to do with the outputs of the vertex shader. So one example where the geometry shader could be used is in particle systems. 
Instead of rendering a quad for each particle, we could instead just render a single point for each particle and then use the geometry shader to generate the quad on the GPU. And it doesn't just have to generate a quad, you could get it to generate a cube or even a more complex mesh in order to have 3D particles. The geometry shader doesn't just have to be used to generate and change geometry though. Another thing that it's very useful for is calculating more information about the vertices that can then be sent on to the fragment shader. There's actually a lot of information that you can calculate in the geometry shader that you can't calculate in the vertex shader because the vertex shader only has access to the one current vertex whereas the geometry shader has access to all the vertices in the primitive. There are also loads of other cool things that you can achieve with the geometry shader that we'll perhaps look at in future tutorials but for now we're just going to take a look at some of the basic GLSL code that you need for the geometry shader. So the very first thing that you need to do in the geometry shader code, apart from specifying the version of GLSL that you're using, is to declare the input and output primitive types. The input primitive type, of course, is just the type of primitives that you're rendering, and this can either be points, triangles, or lines, and there are also two other possibilities that we'll talk about in another tutorial. To specify this input type, we use a layout statement, and we simply have to put in the type of primitive that will be inputted, which must be one of these five options, and it has to match up with the type of primitive that you're rendering. We then finish the line by putting in to indicate that this is the input type. We then specify the output primitive type in exactly the same way, by using a layout statement, putting in one of these three options, and then putting out to indicate that this is the output type. And as I've already said, the output type doesn't have to be the same as the input type, it can be whichever one of these three options that you want it to be. You'll notice also that the output types are triangle strip and line strip, and not just triangles and lines, and this is to allow you to output more than just one triangle or line. Obviously there's no such thing as a point strip, so that's why it's just points. There is however one extra bit of information that we're going to need to specify for the output, and that is the maximum number of vertices that we're going to be generating each time the shader executes. In this example I'm going to be generating two quads, so I'll put eight vertices. Next up we need to define the input and output variables just like we've always done in the vertex and fragment shaders. So as I've already mentioned, the inputs are the same as the outputs from the vertex shader, except they're arrays here and contain one value for each vertex of the primitive. Of course, in this case our input primitive is just points, and seeing as each point is just one vertex, this array is just going to contain one single value, but if we were rendering triangles, then this array would contain three values, one for each vertex in the primitive. Then we define our output variables in the usual way, so this is the information that each vertex we generate is going to have associated with it, and it's the information that's going to get passed on to the fragment shader. And we can of course have some uniform variables which work exactly the same as the other shader stages. So now we move on to the main code of the geometry shader, and this is the code that's going to execute for each primitive. In here we need to set the output variables and the GL position for each of the vertices that we're generating, and we do this for each vertex one at a time. So we start off with the first vertex, and we have to set the GL position variable and any other user-defined output variables, just like we would if we were in the vertex shader. If you want to access the input information about any of the vertices in the primitive, then you can just access that from the input arrays, and of course here the primitives are just points, so there's only one value in each array, but if you were rendering triangles, then there would be more values, and you'd have to choose which vertex you want to get the information for. And it's the same if you want to access the GL position variable for the input vertices, except the GL position variable is actually part of an inbuilt structure called GLIN, so you have to get the GL in for the relevant vertex in the primitive, and then you can access the GL position variable for that vertex from there. And again, we only have one vertex position to access here, but if we were rendering triangles, we'd have three GL positions that we could access. When you're finished setting the values for the first vertex and want to move on to the next vertex, you just have to call emit vertex. Now when we set the GL position and the output variables, we're setting them for the second vertex, and in this case that's the second vertex in the triangle strip, because that's what we're outputting. So I'll do this two more times to create a full quad. If you want to create another triangle strip that isn't connected to the first, or line strip if you're outputting lines, then you just need to call end primitive. Now I can create another quad from four more vertices, which won't be connected to the first quad.
And that is how the geometry shader works. So you can actually download this code from the link in the description and try it out yourself if you want. And you'll see that all I'm doing here is rendering three points, three vertices. And if I wasn't using a geometry shader, this would just appear as three dots on the screen. But in the geometry shader, I process each point and output two quads in the position of the point instead. And so if I go ahead and run this, we don't see three dots, but instead we see two quads being generated at each point. So hopefully that all made sense to you, but if you haven't quite got your head around it yet, I wouldn't worry too much. I'm sure it will get easier when we do a few examples with code in the upcoming tutorials. The main things that I want you to get out of this video are that the geometry shader is a shader stage that goes between the vertex and fragment shader. It executes once for each primitive that gets rendered, and it has access to all of the vertices in that primitive, along with any per vertex information that was set in the vertex shader. It then outputs any number of a certain primitive type, and it can define some per vertex values for the vertices in those primitives. In terms of the code, you define the input and output primitive types like this. Your input variables are arrays, and the same as the outputs of the vertex shader, and you define your per vertex output variables in the same way as always. You then create the vertices of the output primitives one by one, setting the GL position and any other user-defined per vertex output variables, and when you want to move on to the next vertex, you just call emit vertex, and if you want to start a new strip, if you're using triangle or line strips, you just call end primitive. And that is the basics of the geometry shader. So that is going to be it for this week. Thank you guys very much for watching this video. Do subscribe if you haven't already. Have a fantastic week, and I will see you all next time.